Hi, Kat. Oh. Good to see you. <laughs> Hello. Hey. All right. So I said good morning to everyone already, and nobody knew because I was on mute. So in that case, good morning. Welcome all, of course. Uh, the um, agenda notes link is in the chat as always. <sighs> Feel free, anyone who's not already on, to go ahead and add yourself to attendance. Do we have anyone new that would like to say hello, um, introduce themselves today? Hello. Uh, I'm new in the community and uh... Just a second, I want to say hello. Uh, I'm a new in the community. Uh, my name is Arman. I'm a software engineer, uh, former in the Kafa Bazaar in Iran and now in the Citadel Securities in London. And uh, I have experience with a keyword in the Kafa Bazaar. We worked on the virtual machine environment to de de develop and deploy the Kubernetes on the keyword just for research uh, for a new idea. And uh, now it's my first meeting. I'm really uh, excited about uh, joining the Cupid community and understand what's happening. Thank you. Welcome, Arman. It's good to have you. Thank you for joining. All right. Um, it looks like Andrew has added a couple of things to agenda notes. If anyone else has anything to add, feel free to drop those on the Google Doc. And just uh, can I can I add a quick quick update on? I was just thinking. I had just the idea that we might probably um, add the uh, link to the member due diligence to the introductions. Would that make sense, or would that be too early in general? I think what that makes think? sense. Yeah, let me actually grab that real quick, and I can add it in the template. And just to just to update you, Armand, if you are going to regularly contribute to Qbert, then it makes most of the time it makes sense to uh, add yourself to the community, to the Qbert community, which actually is done by a pull request against the Qbert org uh, YAML file, so that you have the rights of um, actually, um, um, for example, um, uh, getting your PRs tested and so on. But yeah, more in the links that, that Katrin, Katrin is going to post. Just, just as a quick heads up on that. Thank you. Hmm, that sounds like something I should do as well. Was that Andrew? Oh, I was just saying that sounds like something I should do as well. I don't think I've done that. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. <laughs> that was a good call. Uh, while you're doing that, do you want me to jump onto the two things I got in there? Yeah, go ahead. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I put most of the information in there, but basically um, our latest release notes to the user guide wasn't updated past um, February, whatever the February release was, 2021. I created a PR yesterday to um, uh, update it to the, to the present using a variation of the script that is in um, the update changelog script in the user guide. Um, now it it looks as though that's that I mean that is included in the make file. My um, non uh, software engineer um, brain presumes that it's included in the make file so that when we release it gets automatically um, pulled in and the release notes are updated. But that doesn't seem to have been having happening since uh, February twenty twenty one. I did find a PR that mentioned. Um, not wanting to, um, oh man, I was, I should have written down what the PR was, but it's basically, um, I think it might even be in these notes, um, saying we don't want to version um, the Qbert user guide, I think. Uh, I think that's separate from this, but I wasn't entirely sure. I was just wondering if anyone um, 
present at this meeting was able to add, uh, shed a new light on maybe why um, this isn't updating, like if there was a conscious decision for it um, or like what the, what the history of this might be. Yeah, I, I probably could chime in on this. I, I have a suspicion. I don't know exactly how it was. The thing was that we were moving away from, from Travis and from automated GitHub pages creation, if I remember correctly, somehow at some point. And maybe this uh, update on the user guide got dropped somehow, but yeah, that's just a suspicion. And um, I think what, what is needed here would be something like um, something um, like whenever there a PR or, or, uh, or a new release is created that, that this update change log script should be script, uh, triggered somehow. And if you want, I, I don't exactly know what the update change log uh, script does to be honest. But if you if you can point me to uh, where it is and uh, how it works, probably a little bit at least, so I can find my way around, I guess. But yeah, I don't even know where it is. So I would be able to just probably um, create something like an automation on that, like like we did on the uh, Qubit pages um, that that where we also have automation. So yeah, I uh, wonder. Uh, oh. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say that I've got the link to the update change log script um, in the agenda. Oh, um, okay. And yeah, it, it does seem to have built into it a, um, a thing that says like if it's an alpha beta or an RC, then it won't um, continue, won't publish. So I think it is designed so that whenever we do have a release, um, it kind of runs that as a basic check to say, oh, I don't need to put release notes out or yes, this does need to have release notes. Um, but yeah. Sorry, Steve. Where, where is this uh, user guide hosted? Because I sort of dimly recall it moving at some point, and this may be a remnants of an ancient, uh, like we weren't intending to continue updating that, but I can't recall. Uh, this is the, um, the what's it called? Kubert.io slash user guide. And up the top, we've got welcome architecture and latest release notes. Now it's um, as Peter pointed out in my PR, uh, latest release notes is kind of um, is slightly misleading because it includes the release notes for every single version that's ever been released. Well, every that's major. the latest, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's perhaps a little too accurate. Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, he also suggested and it crossed my mind that maybe it's just worthwhile linking directly to um, the GitHub release as it is. Um, unfortunately, the GitHub release, like uh, find a release search bar is not very good. Um, I, I did a couple of tests. I was looking for a release or looking for something that I knew was mentioned in two different releases and it kind of like, it, it doesn't give particularly accurate results. And so, and um, having the releases on a sidebar does make it easy if you are on a particular release just to go directly to the release notes of the release that you're on. Um, so I do think there is value in this, especially if, if it can be automated. As I suspect, it's designed to be just for whatever reason, um, it's not being triggered. Was this for hey, every release or just the current release? It, uh, it adds the latest release to the top of the latest release notes file. Does it answer the question? Yes, because the way you had the way you had phrased it sort of sounded like we would need to go back retroactively and fix this since release thirty eight, but it sounds like just the latest would be fine. So I've done that, um, and that's what that the PR I've got in my link is. Um, so it brings it up to 54.1 or something. Um, and for that, I just kind of like you know um, remove some stuff and um, put in a for loop, and then the script just kind of did the job for me. Um, also, while, while we're here looking at this PR, um, if anyone can think of any reason not to merge it, then please say so. Uh, otherwise, we should merge it, I guess. Do you need any sort of formality for like uh, approve or, or LGTMs? I'm not sure. I've got a. Um, 
I've got an okay to test from Peter and there's, I mean, there's a change requested, but the, um, I think from his comment, he's, um, well, he says we should change the title of the page because it's misleading, but um, I don't know. As you pointed out, it is accurate in a way. But I feel like that could be a, a, like a separate PR if we want to, you know, change how how we do this. But at the moment, we've got like we've got very outdated, quote unquote, latest release notes on the user guide. Roger that. Okay, I was a little bit distracted. What's a summary of where we're at on that one? I think we're all agreeing to proceed. And then a reminder on our calling our extra calendar invites end of the month, make sure you are subscribed to the Kubert at cncf.io issued event. The others will be redacted. All right, in that case, we are at the end of this week's agenda. If anyone has anything else they wanna add last second, feel free to do so. Going once, going twice, and we can jump into PRs and bugs. Okay, that is in progress has reviewers. Insane. All right, let's see. All right, so this one about patching, is there anything we wanna do right now to act that one or? I guess it's got CI in progress. Um, why are we going over the PR? Sorry for asking. Um, so usually when we have finished up our agenda and any open floor items, we'll go through and do a bug scrub mailing list review and uh, look for PRs that might be idle or need some attention from within the last week. 
think that the, the that bullet there was if someone wants to if someone wants to have a focus of a specific PR, then he puts it there. Yes, if Otherwise, there's anything that people specifically want attention on, we can add those in and make sure to address those on the meeting as well. Um, if we have time left over, though, we have been going through and looking for anything that might need attention. Anyone else have any feedback on that general routine? Are we OK with that? I think it makes sense to, to look at those. So um, there, there might be uh, PRs that, that someone might not haven't got have gotten to and, and that might be reshuffled around probably, or even maybe someone which shouldn't okay. normally never not, never be the case, but um, that, that, uh, that probably people have left the, the community somehow and, and uh, needs to be reassigned. So I think this makes sense. Yeah, generally I look for any that appear to be um, either unacknowledged or not in progress with CI and reviewers. Um, we could rearrange it so that PRs are the last thing we look at, and we start with like mailing list and uh, mailing list and bug scrub. That might actually make sense. All right. Since last week. Right. Announcement that IP tables is being deprecated. Good to keep in mind. Cloud hypervisor conversation is not idle. That's been going on. I feel like we saw a conversation about this one in chat last week too. But Alicia responded to that one, so we're good there. Um, I know we have a UTC device spec. Do we assign it a time zone in that spec as well? The resounding silence is lack of knowledge. Right. The docs indicate we have a spec for it. Thank you. 
mean, this is a bit weird. Like, let, let's say that there's a data center in a different time zone, but I want to use my VMs on, I don't know, like where the people that use them are located. Like, isn't this a use case? Well, so if we just take a step back, so the, the time zone, the default time zone of the host has nothing to do with the de default time zone inside the container. Uh, yes. So that's not exact, like, it's not clear to me how we would go about this sensibly. Uh, I agree. It's like, it's even worse. It's like the, the host is the control plane and uh, the guest is, is the workload, I guess. So they have nothing to do with each other. And you actually, don't, I don't think you want to have uh, this. Exactly. I agree. I agree. And furthermore, it's configurable, like set it to the time zone you want. This, this reminds me of requesting uh, problems for having connection, network connection between the host and the VM. That's also something you don't want. But anyway, yeah. There are other problems yeah. though that uh, we today we, we handle them by uh, <clears throat> correlating the time uh, from the host and the guest. Like for example, um, when you have a, a very long um, inactivity in the guest, like for example, during migration or uh, um, say, uh, Uh, suspend uh, or resume operations, um, then the time uh, in the guest um, doesn't move. And then there will be a skew in time when the guest is resumed finally. So today, in order to mitigate that, uh, we simply sync uh, the, the guest and the host uh, timestamp. Um, but yeah, That's, thanks for catching that, Vladik. Uh, you, there's two different things mentioned here. You're right. There's the time, which we sensibly should be syncing as well as we can or are able. But time zone, I'm not. I'm not sure that's really. I just don't know what that means. Actually, yeah, that would mm, that would require at least support in a guest agent, like. Uh, feature yeah and, and like you know, as eddie that. was pointed out that we've got the we've got the guest we've got the container and we've got the host there's no syncing between the host and the container in terms of yeah what the etsy time zone would be or anything of that nature so i think the only reasonable way to do this is to put it in the vm spec because i don't i don't know if there's a default other than utc other than that well we we have a spec documented yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, but I thought this was about the default if nothing was specified, right? Fair. Mm. And you, but I, I understand what you're saying, what you are saying that you are solving one problem, but I'm, what I'm telling you is that you are exposing the details of the host to the guest and that's not good yes exactly like i think that the only issue. sensible default is utc yeah but even utc like let's say that you have uh, so you what you actually do is you you gave to the guest knowledge about a very detailed thing on the host i don't know if that's a security problem or not but it sounds weird but but yeah if this is the the reason then i guess it's already there, so. No, I agree, Eddie. Like if you had a widely distributed cluster, having the, the system time of the, the host exposed to the guest would, that, that's a hint about location on the planet, which should be irrelevant. I, but I, I think that if we're not specifying the time zone, then it should be UTC is assumed. And by the way, I, how do you express how do you express the time zone to a, to a guest? Isn't it just by 
you cannot can you specify it any other way except DHCP or some NTP of server? I don't get it. So, Your guest right, agent. It's like the, the what? Guest agent. Ah, the, so you configure the guest agent to do that? Um, it's like, so you mean the guest the agent? Sorry. In, in which case, uh, after migration, uh, after migrations, uh, it, this is just a guest agent set time. It's I'm like not sure what, it, does it sync the time zone or not? I, I didn't check. So it, I mean, after migration, I think the, the, the time zone is not changed. The only thing that can change is the, the time, I guess, right? Yeah, so I'm not entirely sure what set time does. Uh, does it set uh, the time zone or not? But we sync the time. I need to double check uh, what exactly this is. On what I remember, um, at least the initial time zone configuration is passed to the QEMU on the virt launcher code to the QEMU process using the TC environment variable. Then after the guest OS is loading, maybe some user space still disconfigure their own time zone, but at least the initial time zone is passed to the QEMU process with the TC environment variable. Okay, um, I think my response is on point. Uh, can, we, can I get a plus one? I'm hesitating because I'm, I'm assuming that we would have defaulted to UTC. I don't know that we actually do, but other than that, I agree with what you said. That is the, that is the behavior he's reporting at least. So I'm actually just going off of uh, his reported observation for now. Works for me. Um, wonder if his KVM device is available. Can anybody verify? That almost sounds like a architecture conflict. If we're, if it sounds like the file format of the QEMU KVM is attempting to execute doesn't match the host architecture. Am I wrong? Isn't it just KVM not supported there? Yeah. But I, I'm wondering if he just needs to check if the device exists. Uh, you you get a file not found. I th th that's why. Okay. Yeah. 
And the leads replied there already. Oh. Yeah. Ah, okay. I mean, apart that the uh, your system doesn't support KVM, I don't know. It's a quite uh, quite old version. I mean. Ah, good call. Okay. But I don't think it's possible to to check here. Yeah what happens with the information he provides. So I don't know if you want to ask him more information or. Um, I you... think you, your yeah, comment was good. Yeah, we can good. wait, we can yeah. wait. Okay, this is all in progress. Hmm. Version A. It's exciting. Okay, I know that we do have Kuvert successfully detecting. Actually, though, that might be some linked. Um, so I know that for distributions like um, Microshift or uh, Microcates with non-standard kubelet directories, they have solved this by symlinking the kubelet directory to the well-known location. Do you have any other handling that you, anyone knows of besides that method to resolve this issue? I'm not sure, but I think I already read something about the root yeah, of the, the distribution. I know this has come up a few times. Yeah. Trying to remember, recall. Uh, I based the APR um, or the issue was that I think there. So, but I'm not sure if it's solved for all the cases. Okay, um, so it looks like we have that feature to be able to set, which would make sense if you have found the flag. 
but I presume he's reporting it as non-functional. And not reporting, okay. Now I need to, now that I'm part of the group or member list, I need to learn my get commands, don't I? Okay, so it feels like he, this person is addressing two different issues, one being access via vert CTL SSH and the other being access via the TTY. But I know that the serial console requires specific um, kernel argument. Okay. I might be wrong, but if I remember correctly, um, 
In Ubuntu, the serial console is not enabled by default. Right. A lot of the images do not have it enabled by yeah. default. So you can either customize the image or add a uh, configuration by command with um, the like, cloud in it configuration, which I do on a regular basis. So I think, so I can handle the um, do we need, do kernel we arguments. What, do we know what he's using? Yeah, uh, there's a little bit of information in the VM text. I was just looking at it, but it's not extremely like clear. And then um, I th it seems like his his report or they're reporting more specifically um, that vert TTL SSH is a problem. And then going on a tangent with that serial console problem. I can answer the serial console stuff pretty easily. Um, it's the vert CTL SSH command that I am not familiar with. And I don't know what our intended behavior is with bridged virtual machines. I feel like this has also come up before and it was concluded as kind of out of the scope of that subcommand because it I thought that that command did like a uh, local kubectl port forward type behavior, but I am not familiar enough to be certain of that. Anyone here with feedback on the bird CTL SSH part? So we are stuck at the SSH. I'm I'm sorry, breaking up a bunch. Not coming through. Is he is he asking? Um, you're breaking up a lot, but I'm going to summarize what I know that they're asking. I know that they are initially reporting that vert CTL SSH is not working on a bridged virtual machine. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it's for the bridge binding, right? Um, Where is the documentation for the Vert CTL well, I, I know that the work on the uh, in the pod itself it just goes directly to the to the guest. Let me see if I can find. I'm actually, I'm coming up on the end of my ability to stay on. Okay, so we probably need to address this in documentation because I know this has come up a bunch of times.
Okay, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting I need to run, unless someone else wants to take over for the last eight minutes. Going once, going twice, and I will see you all same time, same place next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, you all. Thank you, Thank you. See you all. Bye.